I, uh, this is mainly for, can everyone hear me okay? Is this without the theme? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know Kyle will still hear me this way. So while we get the, um, I, I come back to some of those things that were brought up. I think they'll, they'll play a role at the end of my presentation. And let's get that, let's get that up there. So, hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jason Ross. I'm very glad to be here, rather than in Virginia, where I, where I live. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about uh, the topic of being creativity and courage rather than logic. I think the theme can really be, how did we get here? How is it possible that we've gotten into a mess of proportions as large as what Rachel discussed, where we're on the verge of the economy totally blowing out, we're pursuing a course strategically or militarily that puts us on the verge of war, which would be nuclear war with Russia, adopting a very bellicose position towards China from the standpoint that we will not allow any other nation to become a peer competitor with the United States militarily. That's our military outlook. That's a terrible, ruinous, and you know, guaranteed you're going to have war if you have that kind of policy. How did we get here? Rachel had mentioned that economists will tell you nobody could have predicted the 2007, 2008 stock market collapse, the housing bubble, et cetera. No one could have known that. Well, if you saw the big short, you saw a few people who you know, definitely knew about a part of it and made some money off of it. But that should be cause for alarm. If there hasn't been a radical and complete rethinking about how economics works in light of a crisis in the market that was unpredictable and unknown, that means there's something incredibly wrong with thinking. Incredibly wrong. It means everyone's an idiot. If no one saw this coming. Why, it, 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 what, what's changed? Where, where's the new economic theory? Right? So, how did, how did, in other words, how, how, did, how did we get so dumb? That's, that's the theme. So, let's jump ahead a couple of slides. Um, you know, the, this could be looked at under the rubric of the terrible 20th century. Mr. LaRouche has been pretty emphatic that the 20th century, although it saw a great deal of technological progress, we saw nuclear power, we saw it, we went to the moon, we developed space technologies, new medical breakthroughs, I mean, clearly a lot happened in the 20th century. At the same time, the fundamental basis for making the new scientific breakthroughs that make the technologies possible has been eaten out. I, I, I plan to oh, make that point today, and I'm going to do it in three parts. First, discussing two radically different approaches to thought back from Greece. We'll compare Plato and Aristotle, who have totally different views of the world. Second, we're going to talk about the, the 20th century itself, about the evil of Bertrand Russell, who, I mean, it seems amazing, that quote that Rachel read from him, that seems like the sort of thing someone might have gotten by sneaking in a tape recorder to a closed door event where Bertrand Russell might have you know, admitted that he's hoping for a world dictatorship and mass brainwashing, and if you do this, you can be a dictator without worry of revolutions. But he actually wrote that himself in a book that he published. That's pretty bold. LaRouche has called Bertrand Russell the most evil man of the 20th century. He's got a lot of competition. But <laughs> LaRouche puts him there. So that'll be the second part. And then third, I want to conclude with where science needs to go today. So let's, uh, on the next slide, let's talk, about, let's talk about Greece. And on the next slide, we see a famous figure, prehistoric, well, pre, not a dinosaur, but before, you know, history, uh, Prometheus. People heard of Prometheus? Sorry, Prometheus. Yes. Uh, the story goes, he took fire from heaven, from Zeus, and he brought it to mankind. You know, Zeus was the, this was the prototype tyrant. This is like the pre-Satan Satan here. Right? <laughs> Zeus is saying, hey, I've got fire in heaven, and people, mortals, ugh, they're certainly not going to have fire. They're not going to have knowledge. In fact, I might wipe them all out. That was part, as the stories go, Zeus actually wanted to destroy all human beings, and Prometheus prevented that from happening. So Prometheus didn't just give fire. And fire is what first distinguishes our species from all others. It's not, you know, the position of our thumb. Take a look at National Geographic, so you can find some, uh, you know, some other primates that have thumbs that look like ours. It was the fact that 
Think about that first of technologies, the willful use of fire. That sets us apart totally from the animals. We've now got a, a source of power for our environment. So Prometheus said of mankind, for his gifts of knowledge, he said, though they had eyes to see, they saw to no avail. People had ears, but they did not understand. They had no knowledge of houses or of work in wood. They had no sign either of winter or of flowery spring or fruitful summer. No calendar, no understanding of astronomy in the year. Until, Prometheus says, I taught them to discern the risings of the stars and their settings. Prometheus says that before him, human beings didn't use beasts of burden to ease our labor. No sailing ships, no medicine, no metallurgy. What can you do with fire? You can create things that don't exist anywhere on Earth. Bronze. There's no bronze anywhere on this planet except what people have made. It doesn't exist. Iron? You don't find pellets of iron. Maybe a few from meteorites, but you know, there's no iron on the planet. It's always mixed with other elements. We create it. In a short, he says, every art possessed by man comes from Prometheus. So that's an outlook about what it means to be a human being. The ability to discover, the ability to do these new things, to change our relationship with nature, to understand those principles that make key things happen. So next, let's look at, uh, we'll compare Plato and Aristotle. We're painted here in this, uh, this is the center of Raphael's school of Athens. And you see on the left, Plato, wearing the head of Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> Walking forward, pointing to the heavens. And you see Aristotle on the right saying, whoa, we're done. We're not moving anywhere. I've already got gold frills on my rope. We don't need anything else. Amazing. <laughs> now, if we compare these two, the, the outlooks of these two, let's go ahead and, and take a look at this quote on the next slide here. This is from Plato's dialogue with Timaeus, where he describes the creation of the world. He says, God desired that so far as possible, all things should be good and nothing evil. Wherefore, when he took over all that was visible, seeing that it was not in a state of rest, but in a state of discordant and disorderly motion, he brought it into order out of disorder, deeming that the former state, order, isn't always better than the latter. For him who is most good, it neither was nor is permissible to perform any action save what is most fair. In this translation, fair meaning beautiful, not you know, just. So that's an outlook on the world, that it's really in the best possible way it could be. It's been composed in a way that's beautiful. He wrote a dialogue uh, called the Nino, where he, where he has a discussion about creativity and about human relations. Now, in this dialogue, he's talking with a wealthy friend of his about whether people can know things, how people know things, etc. And he gives him a challenge. He has this rich friend of his call out one of his slaves. And Socrates, Plato wrote dialogues that include Socrates. They're both real people. Socrates has a talk with this slave boy and shows that the ability to discover something new about geometry was in that boy's mind. I'm not going to go, if you haven't gone through this before, find somebody at the end of the meeting to go through this with you. I don't want to spoil it. So he showed two things. One is that there's something in the mind that's able to create and to recognize truth that doesn't come from observation just from having seen things a lot of times and recognized the trend. But a new thought came out of this boy's mind of something that he had never seen before at all. He created, you know, it's a discovery, something new. And the other point was, this was a slave who did this. This is something universal about people. In contrast, Aristotle, in his book, The Politics, had this to say about slaves. The slave is living possession and property, an instrument. 
that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation, others for rule. That's Aristotle compared to Plato in this dialogue showing how even a slave can be a genius. So, pretty big difference. Now, Aristotle's overall view in terms of how knowledge comes about is that it comes from the past, that it comes from things that we've already seen before. It comes from the senses. And let me see if I think I've got it for here. Oh, good. And what about our senses is it that makes human beings able to discover and parakeets not? Well, while in respect of all the other senses, we fall below many species of animals, in respect to touch, we far excel all other species in exactness of discrimination. <laughs> that is why man is the most intelligent of animals. <laughs> Sounds like a bullet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is that guy on the subway, you know? <laughs> so, and let's get another quote on this, uh, this free here. So how do, we, how do we find out new things? Well, Eric Suttle says, here's how you find out new things. All instruction given or received by way of argument proceeds from pre-existing knowledge. We have already said that scientific knowledge through demonstration is impossible unless a man know the primary immediate premises. How does man know? I'll give you an example about one of these primary immediate premises. Um, you might say the um, you know all birds fly, and then you find something and you say, oh, "This is a bird, therefore it flies." You know, so the immediate, the, the primary premise is all birds fly. How did you come to that conclusion? Which also isn't a true one. <laughs> Let's see his quote on the next slide. How do we get those basic thoughts? He says, well, our sense perception comes to be what we call memory. And out of frequently repeated memory of the same things develops experience. Or a number of memories constitute a single experience. From experience originates the knowledge of the man of science. Now, clearly, you do have to actually look at the world around you to discover things. You know, that's that's involved in science. You know, if you had, you know, no equipment, no, you know, you, there's definitely some things you're never going to figure out, right? But the idea that knowledge comes from having repeated something a number of times and then say, oh, that must always happen. Is that where you get something new? So you, it is the way you train a dog. Yeah, it works. Well, yeah, that's great. You know, oh, you know when you do that, you get a treat. You know, the dog knows. That's good. And that does. It works for animals. It can work for people, too, if they think that way. If they act like animals. But no, when the first electric motor was developed, was it by somebody observing a bunch of electric motors? And saying, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Where did it come from in the first place to be observed? Right? You, have to, you know, when you make a new technology, you have to make it to ever even observe it doing something new, right? So, okay. So let's uh, let's go to the next one here. So I think that that's a that's a an idea from the past, of Greece, of Plato, and the idea that there's something in the mind that creates ideas, versus Aristotle, who says that it's our experience of the external world that then prints itself on us, and that's where we get ideas from, from our senses, from observation, versus Plato, who's saying we need to bring something to it. We need to make those hypotheses, those concepts, that those concepts that truly understand the world around us have something to do with our mind, because our mind is able to create ideas that have power. Imagine if every thought that anyone ever had was never worked. Right? If the mind had no power over nature. Right? It's not that way. Our mind we made new things happen by the power not of you know claws or anything like that or touch. <laughs> Feeling things, right? But by coming up with a, a hypothesis of hey, this this is a cause this causes things to happen. Let's use it in a new way. Let's make something that's never happened before happen. 
<laughs> so that's the first part. So that's that's the ancient. Now let's take a look at this past 20th century. The, the, the terrible two is the second millennium. <laughs> All right, <laughs> but hopefully it won't last all millennia. Okay, never mind. No, just, yeah, yeah. So um, in 1900, something bad happened from Bertrand Russell. And to get into it, I first want to talk, come back to, to logic a little bit. So remember I said, all birds fly. Um, cuckoo is a bird. Therefore, cuckoo flies. That's a, let's call it a syllogism. It's a logical, you know, it's a way to come to a logical conclusion. We've got our, our basic, our major premise, all birds fly. We've got our minor premise, cuckoo is a bird. And our conclusion, cuckoo flies. Um, well, I guess we covered already the question of where do you come up with those initial premises? Aristotle says this by observation. Here's the thing. You can't logically conclude something that disagrees with what you already think. If you do, you've got a paradox. And then you say, well, something must be wrong. Some of my initial assumptions are wrong. But you don't use logic to come up with something that disagrees with what came before. You can't use logic to conclude something that uses a new word. Think about it simple in terms of language. How is logic going to come up with a new word or a totally new concept? It won't. The thing with logic is that you might say, well, who cares about logic anyway, right? Well, logic is a way of thinking where from certain statements, you can derive other statements according to rules that shouldn't introduce any error. It's totally divorced from whether things are true or not, whether they're real concepts, how they get discovered. Let's take a look at the next picture here. We got, here's what happened in 1900. That's part of the reason that LaRouche says this is the, you know, the terrible 20th century. For one thing, we have the death of Brahms and the collapse of music, but I'm not going to discuss that today. In 1900, in August, this guy, I wasn't wearing that hat at the time, spoke at a conference <laughs> of mathematicians in Paris. And he said, he, he laid out some questions where he said, these are the, you know, the top 10 questions for math. If we try to figure out the answers to these things, we'll really move forward. And one of them, hmm, yeah, so let me read this quote. We establish the correctness of a solution by means of a finite number of steps based on a finite number of hypotheses. This is the requirement of rigor in reasoning. Indeed, the requirement of rigor corresponds to a universal philosophical necessity of our understanding. Is some idea correct? Well, let's see if we can derive it from what we already knew. If we can, it's correct. We never get anything new that way. So one of Hilbert's questions was, can we turn all of arithmetic into logic? Can we start with some basic ideas and then use logic to conclude everything about arithmetic from it? Can we do that with the sciences overall? Now, Bertrand Russell thought this was just fantastic. He was really he thought, wow, I'm going to spend years of my life trying to turn arithmetic into, into a branch of logic. This is worth my time. Now, why would it be worth, worth Russell's time? Right, this is an evil man who played a major political role. He's an ancestor of, like, you know, like, he comes from a family of like, top rulers of England. And he's about to, as we'll see, spend years writing books about mathematical logic. Why, would he, why, would he, why is this worth this while? Well? Let's put it in context. Let's look at the next thing here. So, at the same time, a revolution was occurring. In 1900, Max Planck proved that we didn't understand what light was. He showed that the way light um, interacts with bodies, like the light coming through these pipes, like uh, <laughs> light coming off an old-fashioned light bulb where it gets hot and it glows, that the only way to understand it was that light came in little pieces. Now, for over 150 years, everyone said that light was a wave. So Planck, with his concept of the quantum, just totally transformed what everybody thought light was. That's a big breakthrough. Like, in other words, that's something that didn't come from logic. It was a new hypothesis. You couldn't prove it from what came before. It was new. In 1905, Albert Einstein had his miracle year. This is the year where he demonstrated special relativity, that space and time 
aren't independent. That space isn't flat. That whether two events occur before or after each other depends on how you're moving when you look at those two events. He showed that from that, it follows that every bit of mass has energy in it by E equals mc squared. That there's this phenomenal amount of energy hiding in every bit of matter. He didn't know what that would mean at the time, but he said, this, this follows from my discovery. So those basic ideas of space and time and matter and energy all just got totally transformed by Einstein in 1905. It wasn't logical. It was illogical. It was a discovery. So what does Bertrand Russell do? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. Here's what he does. So in 1900, right, Planck figures out, hey, light isn't what we thought. In 1903, Russell writes a math book. In 1905, Einstein figures out space, time, energy, matter. It's all, well, this is all totally different stuff. What does Russell do? He spends several years writing even longer math books. <laughs> the title is now in Latin, so you know the series, right? <laughs> 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 So, in the midst of, all of this breakthrough, here's Russell still trying to prove that science is all about just taking things from the past and deriving things from it. That nothing new will ever really happen. Meanwhile, new things are happening. <laughs> you know, you say, is this guy just crazy or is he evil? And I think we know the answer to this, whether he's evil from what Rachel showed us. Now, Few things happened. In 1931, um, Kurt Gödel proved, using Russell's math, that Russell was wrong. He, um, you know what, you can ask about the Q&A, and, uh, and I'd be happy to go through it, but I don't want to take too much time to get into it right now. But um, Gödel basically proved that if you tried to do what Russell is doing, and have a, a, a closed uh, a system that is able to tell you everything that's true about arithmetic and not have any paradoxes in it, that it was complete and free of paradox, that that was just not possible. You couldn't prove you had that. Well, what does Russell write about that year? He writes about having a scientific dictatorship. <laughs> so, a little bit of steam, couple, you know, days later, he writes about brainwashing. So, let's take a look at the, uh, the next slide. So, the, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's too long. Well, it's not Russell. <laughs> so, talk about one other fight. Um, now we're moving into the third part about where do we go in the future here. So, I want to mention something about Einstein again. So, you, you see Einstein on the, the bottom row here. This is the Solvay Conference of, of Physics from 1927. And this is where everybody got together to talk about the quantum, basically. So other people there were, uh, here's, a, here's Niels Bohr. Um, I'm really going to talk about that. There, there's Max Planck. So at this, at this meeting, Bohr and his friends really wanted to meet up on Einstein. They said that because of where quantum theory is gone, the idea of cause no longer exists. That we honestly, God couldn't even tell you what's going to happen. That there's a fundamental randomness in nature, and that no discovery in the future could ever bring reason to it. That we've, le we've reached the limits of reason. It's just uncertainty and it's just statistics, and that's all that there is to it. And at this conference, which is you know, which is a Russell outlook, it's a, you know, it's just what what can we say? In fact, Niels Bohr said, science is no longer about how the world is. <coughs> science is about what can we say about. So he's saying, Niels Bohr is saying, not only, you know, maybe, maybe some things are hard to figure out, he's saying that we've reached the end of science. The idea of actually knowing what is really going on in the world, forget it. What can you say about what will happen if you do some experiment? What will be the outcome? What will we see? What will the experiences be? But the idea of us knowing why or what's making it happen is impossible. Now Einstein, he, he can go along with that, right? You know, he has some of these, you know, these funny lines that are associated with them. Like, I like to think the moon is there even when I'm not looking at it. It's one of the things that Russell said, uh, that, that Einstein said. 
So, you know, Einstein really stood up against this in the 20th century to say, no, we actually can't figure out why things happen. And so now, let me, let me talk about some things. Let's take a look at the next one. Let's talk briefly about where we're going to go, where we are going in the future, where science ought to go, where it's, how it's going to help that. I mean, there's a few fields. One is going more into the very small. We don't really know how the nuclear world works. We don't know everything about it. The physical world, we, you know, we, we've got a lot of understanding about it. Chemistry, we've got a pretty good understanding of chemistry. You know, if you do some chemical reaction, you can, you know, some science, you know, they can, they can predict how much heat it'll generate, how fast it'll occur. We really know that stuff pretty well. When it comes to the nuclear world, we haven't, we haven't figured it all out. And some of the basic stuff, like, you know, how to make a nuclear plant better than a Soviet one from half a century ago, that we know. <laughs> you know, we, you know we've, we've improved in that way. But take fusion. We don't have fusion power plants right now. Fusion is where you basically just put two hydrogens together and get a helium, as opposed to our current power plants, which break up uranium and release energy that way. Um, either way, the nucleus has 100,000 times as much energy as chemical bonds. The bonds that hold together a molecule, when you break them apart or put them together like burning coal, a certain amount of energy comes out. When you break up or put together a nucleus, 100,000 times as much energy per mass. It's just a whole new world there. But we haven't figured it out. We don't know why things decay when they do. We can't predict in advance you know, whether if you smash two things together, they'll stick together or not. We just don't know it all yet. So that's, that's a place we need to go. The galaxy as a whole. Plenty of room for new discoveries on these things. There's ideas about dark matter based on stars moving more quickly in the outer parts of the galaxy than we would expect. So physicists have said, well, there's just some dark matter that we can't see that's making them spin faster. We've never seen it. We have no test for it. Never discovered it. They just say it's there. There's more to figure out about that. How about the relationship of the galaxy and cosmic rays with climate? There's definite correlations between cosmic radiation and things like cloud cover, things like weather over millions of years, even things like evolution. Looking at the change in the amount of biodiversity over evolutionary time, over 500 million years, there's a correlation, that might sound amazing if you've never heard this before, between you know, the number of different types of species that goes up and down, and the motion of our sun through the galaxy, above and below the plane of the galaxy. So there's just, why is that happening? You know, these are the kinds of things that we need to figure out. Unfortunately, one of these studies about cosmic rays and weather has gotten into a lot of trouble because if you say that anything is causing the weather to change besides CO2, you're not looked upon very well. <laughs> so some of these studies about how, you know, what's actually a you know, major uh, driver of weather is, you know, the sun. Crazy idea. Not just from its heat, but from the fact that its changing intensity changes the amount of cosmic rays that are able to make it to the Earth then changes cloud cover. And of course, when it's cloudy, less sun gets through. And now that changes temperature over time. You know, these are things to figure out. So I just want to end with another, um, you know, Rachel ended with the principle of light, and so I want to mention one as well. Um, to me, it gets at the point that when we think about ourselves and the universe, we have to remember that we're a force of nature. Right? Human beings are a force of nature. Our minds, our ability to discover things, changing what exists on the planet, that's, what a, that, that's a force of nature. The mind is powerful. So, you know, Leibniz said that nothing happens without a reason. That you've got to have a sufficient reason. Why is it so, rather than otherwise? And he doesn't just mean each moment comes from the next moment. Why did that book fall off the table? Well, it's because my elbow bumped it. Why did my elbow bump it? Well, because I was reaching for my water, and I slipped, and you know, why are you reaching for your water? Well, I was thirsty. That's not the kind of sufficient reason he needs. Although he did believe that moment to moment, yeah, there were causes. But, you know, why are the laws of nature the way that they are? You can't say it's because some other physical law pushed on them and made them happen that way. You might say this electron moved because there was a static electric field and pushed on it, et cetera, et cetera. Why are the laws of nature what they are? What made, them, what made those laws of physics happen? What made those laws of music? those principles of musical composition. Why them instead of others? 
Um, it says the only way you get a justification for that is not in force and moment-to-moment -moment thoughts, but in fitness or in goodness. And that goes along with this concept that we live in the best of all possible worlds. Leibniz said that among all conceivable worlds, all possible worlds, we live in the best one. People attacked him. I said, well, someone just got murdered. There's poverty. You know, we saw these charts of heroin. How could this be the best of all possible worlds? Looks pretty lousy right now. Leibniz would say, well, <laughs> It wouldn't be a very good world if we didn't have free will. Right? We couldn't be good or evil if we didn't have a choice. So, of course, people can choose to be evil. But it's good that a society that doesn't express beauty, that doesn't express creativity, that has a culture that you know, looks at things in terms of sensual pleasures and without a future orientation, it's actually good that a culture like that would collapse. If it didn't, there'd be no, you know, I might say wake up call that, hey, you need to change the way you think about yourselves and about your culture. If you could be evil and have great results, <laughs> that would actually be a bad world. Yes. It's good that bad doesn't work. So, um, I think that's, that's what I wanted to say. And I just take a couple questions now before we move on. There are <coughs> Maybe I could sort of respond to those earlier ones. <laughs> um, well, on, on the uh, in case on the um, yeah you know, on the nuclear plant, I'll just say you know, we, you know there are new engineering. I mean, some of these older plants, the Chernobyl design is not one that exists anywhere in the U.S. None of our plants are built like that. Um, you know, Three Mile Island, it, that was about as bad as it could get. It didn't kill anybody. Fukushima definitely had a disaster. I mean, the tidal, you know, a tsunami hit the area. You had tens of thousands of people killed. More than that displaced. Tens of billions of dollars, if not more, in you know, property damage. And yes, one of the, you know, one of the things that happened was that the, the plant got hit. The backup generators uh, failed, which is, you know, among all the things that got destroyed, yeah, that, that was a bad thing. The newer, the newer plant designs rely on what are called passive safety technologies. Most of the current ones require pumps to be able to function, to keep things cool, to keep things moving, etc. So the, the newer designs make it impossible um, passively for a meltdown to ever occur. By things like, for example, keeping the fuel in, little, uh, in, in, in pellets, in balls, that would withstand the highest temperature they could ever have without melting. So the fuel simply could never get any closer together, and you know, in that way, have a have a maximum temperature. Um, so you know that yeah, there there are, there are real technical challenges that can be overcome, and a lot of advancements occurred in that front. And uh, I I don't come into here thinking that Chernobyl was an engineered event, because I keep hearing it from multiple sources really engineered event, and there were some screw-ups um, that happened, but basically it was an engineered event. There were um, either very high explosives or possibly re-engineered to make them smaller. Um, multiple nuclear devices buried in the seabed at the fault line. Most of that ship, except for of, of the low level crew... Are you talking about Fukushima or Chernobyl? Fukushima. Chernobyl was an accident. Fukushima was an engineered event. The mushroom cloud over it was because there was a nuclear device literally placed in as put in as the thing that was supposed to be being put in was a closed circuit TV camera in the containment vessel, but a 1,500 pound L shaped large tube with two subcritical masses facing each other with explosive charges behind them. When the, those charges get detonated, it goes critical, and that's why there was a, a, a mushroom cloud over it. And um, there was a very famous, probably almost globally noted person who was caught on um, tape by a Far Eastern intelligence network boasting to a friend he actually ordered the thing to be done, although I think there were a lot of other people involved in having it happen. Major, yeah, major engineered event. For, same way 9-11 was an engineered event. 
and no Muslims involved except as patsies. But some of the same people who the who did 9-11 to us um, were actually from the same country, the, the team that put in the nuclear device in the container vessel. And the, the people who say that have reasonable credibility. Okay. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, if Germany is um, dismantling their nuclear facilities, how do they expect to, um, you know, keep up to speed with industrial production and, you know, power you know, output? Um, you know. They really haven't been, and you know, that one of the one of the biggest pushbacks against these policies is from industrial associations in Germany. You know, on, on the energy policy, and then also on um, it will come to me. You know, on um, oh, on the on the sanctions against Russia. You know, because it's destroying their business. They do a lot of business with Russia. They're saying it's crazy. You know, you're, we're destroying, hurting Germany more than Russia by doing this, and because the power rates in Germany are just you know going up and up and up. I mean, they, they they're over. On average in Germany now, there's something like five or six times the U.S. average. Like if you're an industrial, so, you know, it's like over, it's like 30 or 40 cents a kilowatt hour compared to about 10 cents now here in the U.S. So it's a cost of fortune. So what they've been doing is they've been importing power from other countries, including nuclear power. <laughs> they just can't do it without it. And they've been having, um, they've been having power shortages, and they are losing their industry. It is, in other words, you know. You, you can't have this dream of we're in a bunch of windmills and actually have all the industry that gives Germany its tax base to be a developed nation. Right. And so the industries are they're moving out. They're gone. They they have no choice. They just they can't locate their facilities there and pay those rates. Yeah, right. It's right. too expensive. Well, thank you. Um. I have two questions. Where? One is, what's the YMS work that Rachel read the excerpt from? Um, that is called um, it's 1714, which is near the end of his life, and it's called Principles of Nature and Grace Based on Reason. Thank you. Uh, the second question was, I, I would be interested to hear you uh, talk about the, the proof that, uh, from the... Oh, yeah, the, sure. The girl, yeah, yeah girl's proof of... Sure. So, um, let's see, Gerdel wanted to find a paradox in Russell's system. And Russell was, he, basically Russell made a new way of talking about logic and mathematics that he developed just to prevent paradoxes. And here's an example paradox from Russell. He said, let's say there's a town where every man shaves. And every man who shaves himself is not shaved by the barber. Every man who does not shave himself is shaved by the barber. Who shaves the barber? <laughs> we have those two rules, right? Every man who shaves himself is not shaved by the barber. Mm -hmm. So if he shaves himself, then he didn't shave himself. Every man who does not shave himself is shaved by the barber. So if he doesn't shave himself, then he does shave himself. And you know, all men shave, let's presume the barber's a man. So, barber, you know, yeah. the, barber, uh, the barber's a woman. Yeah, we both need to get the same barber. So, he would answer that. Who shaved the barber? Right? You, just, you can't answer. That's a logical paradox. So, you know, in the description of that town, there's an impossibility. A town like that with those laws, you know, it just couldn't exist. Or there's other ones that kind of. I think Don Quixote has got one about, you know, you're crossing a bridge, and it, when you cross the bridge, if you tell the truth, then you're allowed to cross it, and if you lie, you're, you know, you're going to kill. You get hung. You get hanged. So, and a man walks across the bridge, and he says, I'm going to be hanged. Well, if he told the truth, we can't hang him. If he lied, we would, but he said he would be hanged. So, you know, you know those, are, those are paradoxes. Mm. Uh, I was just going to say, is, is that then an example of a singularity that shows that one of your premises is wrong? Yeah, it shows that in, you know, it shows that among your assumptions there was an error. So what, the, the way that those ones come about though is those are self-referential paradoxes. So the barber is both a person in the city and he's part of the rules, so that kind of screws things up. 
Whenever you're allowed to make statements about themselves, it's easy to get a paradox. Like the guy crossing the bridge made a statement about the bridge crossing rules. He said, I'm going to be hanged. So he's, he's like, he's talking about the rules for deciding whether he's going to be hanged. Yeah, I can't figure it. So Russell said the way we will avoid that is that he made a new kind of way of writing down language where you could never talk about yourself. <laughs> it's for those people at parties, you know. <laughs> um, so what he did was he basically, in his language, he said there's statements, there are num you know, there's like numbers, like number three or five or something like that. Then there's statements about numbers, like two plus two equals four. Then there's statements about statements about numbers, like if a plus b equals c and c plus c equals d, then a plus b equals two d or you know whatever. And he would have a level for how many levels of abstraction higher that statement was in a basic number. So the statement about numbers would be a level one statement. A number would be a level zero statement. Something like that. So the way Gurdon got around it, oh, and then he said any statement can only talk about lower order things. So no, no sentence could talk about itself. So it's a kind of a convoluted thing just to avoid this, this trouble of being able to talk about itself. The way Gurdon got around it was he figured out a way to turn any statement into a number. So the statement, it's not quite like this, but it's something like, this statement is false, turned into the number 12. And then you would say, 12 is a true statement. <coughs> And then, I don't know, it's a, you know, you know, you get the paradox and it breaks down. It's basically like that. The, the, the main trick was to turn statements into numbers, so that then you could have a statement about a statement, and then you could have that barber paradox or the Don Quixote bridge crossing paradox. Basically, Gödel figured out a way in Russell's language to say, this statement is false, which meant that he blew it up. Which means, like you pointed out, that means that something about those initial assumptions was wrong. So Russell's idea that uh, he figured out how to get all of arithmetic from a few basic assumptions, nope, Gurdle has found a paradox. So that, that really blew apart his whole, his whole dream. And his actual book <laughs> about math and all, it's really not very interesting. He was doing it more as a proof of principle to say, look, I took this branch of thought and I turned it all into logic. See, it can't be done. So it, it, it wasn't. Or it tore it up. Which also, which means, incidentally, that artificial intelligence is impossible. I mean, we've got machine learning right now that does useful things. Like Google Images, you send it an image and it finds a similar image. You know, that's nice. Self-driving cars, that's useful. That's not really artificial intelligence. I mean, it's not artificial creativity. Let's put it that way. You're never gonna get artificial creativity. You know, Google, Google Composer. Is not going to you know write the Brahms by writing the Brahms symphonies or something like that. A Google scientist isn't going to you know figure out how to build a you know a fusion power plant. You might drive a car, that's fine. But um, what Gödel proved is that you know any, when you got that logical system like a computer program, it's just you're not going to get something out of it that disagrees with what you put into it. But every discovery does that. And that's what Einstein and Plunk did, for example, in the last century, the beginning of it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't just say add something to space. I took apart what he thought space was, and now it's something different. Oh, mass and energy, he thought those were separate. I didn't just you know, add a statement about them. I changed what those words even mean. And logic can't do that. So we still need people. Computers in the world. They might drive us somewhere, and that's great. <laughs> I, I would love a self-driving car, but uh, it's not going to be. It's not going to be creative. <laughs> so. Well, the self-driving car. I mean, the scenarios have already been programmed into it. It knows not to change lanes when another car's there because it's been programmed. It's not like it's figuring that out for itself, is it? No, it's true. And in fact, that's the crazy thing. Some people were 
you know, crazy, people think about the craziest things. Think about how to, how to murder somebody with a self-driving car. That if it was driving down the street, you and like 10 of your friends would jump in front of it, and then it would say, oh, I, don't, I should kill one person instead of 10, and they would drive into the other person. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and who would be indicted, you know, anyway? <laughs> no, I mean, you're right. I mean, they, they obviously, people have to train it and everything. And if there's some really unusual situation, yeah, you know. I guess, you know, maybe they tell it to just stop or whatever. I mean, you never really get a software with that fuzz. Right. But they say, well, people, you know, I mean, you know, I don't mean, I mean, not, not to in any way underplay the deaths from suicide or heroin, but, you know, motor vehicle accidents take, you know, they win the prize in terms of uh, avoidable deaths in the U.S. So, could, you know, even if it screws up sometimes, it definitely, it does have the potential probably to be uh, safer than people driving. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, one other question, maybe this is for Rachel on you, but in, in Russell's uh, description of what uh, sort of the technology of convincing People snow is black, or Huxley's later writings. Uh, is there any description in those books about sort of what their what their motivation is, or, or why they think it's important that people be uh, people be controlled to say snow is black, or is that just under is it implicit in there that they're writing for a certain audience oh. who, who sort of innately understands because of their advantaged position that it's to their advantage to enable other people to be fooled and, and self-reinforce that. Right, well the, um, this is, I mean, yes, I, they're, they're pretty explicit about it. I mean, you heard in that quote from Rachel that, I think it was in that quote, that Russell was talking about the scientific dictatorship being able to run things on him. Russell also, he's not very uh, ashamed to talk about how dark races are multiplying more rapidly, we can't have that, so we're definitely going to have to especially try to call them back. We should have a black death every generation to keep the population down. So, I mean, some of the stuff he's explicit about, that there should be an heiress, you know, there should be a, I mean, Russell said we should have a world government. He wanted to use nuclear weapons against Russia to create a world, one world government at the end of World War II. He said, we got them, they know, let's do it. Um, definitely didn't like black people. <laughs> and uh, thought that the world's population should be less. So I don't know how much ex more explicit they were about some other things. I mean, Brave New World is pretty, uh, you know, it's a pretty worked out idea of what kind of society you want to have. Mm -hmm. And it, you know. Yeah, it's weird. It's, it's, it's all out there. I could just say. But they, in fact, H.G. Wells wrote The Open Conspiracy, where he was like, let's just lay it all out there. Here's what we want to do. And it's a good idea. <laughs> you should have a dictatorship.